Now for this session, I'm not going to do elaborate introductions, but as mm -hmm. if you've paid attention, you know we have a preeminent economist and a preeminent anthropologist, <coughs> each of whom I know has been significantly engaged in critique of the Army Marine Corps Counterinsurgency Field Manual, which we spent most of our conference last year in discussion of. So in the midst of our discussion of reconsideration of American power, it seemed like a very good idea to think as we turn increasingly towards disciplinary issues and how the social science disciplines relate to American power to have two strong and disciplinary grounded critiques of the manual to think with. So these presentations are more open-ended. We have a little more time, but I'm hoping we'll get some discussion in both after each presentation and after them all. Okay. Thank you. Good. I appreciate the great privilege of, 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 of the time here. Um, so I want to talk about, I, I think the, uh, Questions of, of post-conflict nation building, of, uh, of, of yes, of counterinsurgency, of, of, re of recovery from financial meltdown. The, these questions focus us on fundamentals and give us an opportunity to think about social theory more fundamentally. That's what I'd want to talk about. I want to talk from and give you a non-technical economic economics perspective on, uh, on, on, on what, where I see foundations of social theory. Uh, becoming more clear uh, when I think about the great problems of counterinsurgency, my critique of, uh, of America's uh, in, uh, intervention in Iraq was, is, it, it, this it, it, that I'm talking about today has nothing to do with the decision to go in, the goals, or any attempt to psychoanalyze decision makers who, uh, who ordered the invasion. I simply want to talk about the question of nation building, and if, if you are motivated to, to, to try to reconstruct a nation, uh, what's involved, because we need to understand how are the, how are the, what are the foundations of the core institutions that make a successful society? I won't be talking, I think Ashraf Ghani's uh, book on failed states for, uh, is, is a, uh, is, and, uh, and James Dobbins' series on the, uh, the, the learning from the 1990s experiences in nation building, uh, I think are, 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 are magnificent books. I have the least to say about them. Uh, this is the University of Chicago, and I want to start with, uh, you know, a good broad intellectual perspective of, of uh, uh, I, I'll, the, the, I'll talk about Bremer's, uh, what, the view that Bremer expresses in his My Year in Iraq and the Counterinsurgency Field Manual that the U.S. Army under J David Petraeus uh, uh, put together in, in, in a few years ago. Uh, but I think, uh, uh, as I say, a, a good University of Chicago perspective is, that, is to look back to another multi, multinational invasion of Iraq, uh, the one that, uh, that Xenophon wrote about in about 360 BC. It was ancient history to him. It, it happened around five, five something B, 500 something BC. Um, and, uh, and, but, but Xenophon, uh, who, by the way, wrote also the econo economist, uh, Economicus, uh, therefore could be called the first economist, and uh, I'll claim him. Um, but uh, in, in the education of Cyrus, his, one of his ancient philosophical classics, he is specifically talking, he talks about the questions of regime change between democracy and autocracy at the start. He says, we just need to start by thinking, before we think about democracy, uh, oligarchy or, or monarchy, we need to just understand how a state is founded, and the best way to do that is to look at, at a monarchy, that was, which is the simplest kind of regime that was founded by a great man. And he says, now I'm going to look at the life of Cyrus the Great, who founded the Persian Empire as a lesson in nation building. And this story, and this is a, a trivial point. I, to, to find something I could put on one slide, here's a good story that, like uh, any good story, uh, encapsulates in some sense all of his points. Uh, and this is actually when Cyrus is, li is like a, is, a, is a young boy. He's, I imagine it was being like 11 or 12. And uh, Cyrus's father was the petty king of Persia, then a minor uh, rustic kingdom in the mountains of what, south of what's now Iran. And the real power was uh, the, the great king of Medea, who was, was, was based somewhere near Tehran. Um, and. Uh, and, and, and Cyrus's mother was one of the great king's daughters that had been married off to this petty chieftain. Uh, and uh, so one day, uh, mom takes uh, young Cyrus to go visit grandpa, and grandpa says, you know, now you're in a real palace, not like your father's, you know, crude huts in the mountains. And uh, what, what a great meal I'm serving you. And the kid says, no, no, we Persians, uh, you know, we, we're not so tied up with materialistic things as you, uh, you Medeans. Uh, and, and Grandpa uh, Astyagus, the king, the great king, says, uh, "You know, feast on all these meats so you can go home a vigorous youth." And Cyrus says, "Are you giving me all this meat, Grandpa, to use however I want?" Yes, by Zeus, I, my child, I am by Zeus. So then Cyrus takes the meat 
and he divides it and, and distributes it to his grandfather's servants and says to each, this is for you because you teach me to ride with enthusiasm, for you because you gave me a javelin, for you because you serve my grandfather nobly, I like that best, for you because you honor my mother. He proceeded like this until he had distributed all the meat he received. And it won't surprise you that by the end of the story, Cyrus has usurped the throne of Medea. What has he done? He has begun to establish that, so let's, there, there is a book, uh, uh, I'm sorry, about management secrets of Cyrus the Great, and I can't read it. It just seems to so badly miss the point. What, Cy what Xenophon is telling us is that leadership is important in the foundations of the state, and a, but a particular attribute of leadership. That Cyrus establishes the Persian Empire in this cartoon myth that I'm some that Xenophon wrote for us and that I'm summarizing to you in one or two slides, he, he, he cultivates a reputation for generously rewarding good service. Cyrus is the kind of guy who watches and makes, they talk about endlessly in the book about how he loves justice. And, 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 this, and I'm, I'm sure many, many undergraduate essays have been written about love of justice based on this. But what kind of justice? He is not talking about justice for peasants, for example. When the army goes through a district, they just expropriate the cows. And uh, th th that's not, the justice he's talking about is that Cyrus loves nothing better than to watch professional killers do their thing in battle and reward them with the booty in proportion to their valor. He just loves just, he, he loves justly paying out rewards to service in battle. And uh, so the thesis I want, by, he cultivates this reputation. By the end of the book, Xenophon, I think, is telling us not to take it so seriously as being truth, because you can't really tell, does he, re he says, I don't really want any material objects, but by the end of the, end of the book, He's living in a big palace, he's starting to wear eyeshadow, and he has to stand, you can't, you can't come, he stands up on the stage, you have to grovel when you come to him. He's, he's living a pretty good life, but he still pays his, his captains carefully and, and accurately. He's, he's, he still is very attentive to paying his soldiers and his, his, his lieutenants for their service. Uh, so the point that, does he really love justice or is he a selfish materialist who's just pretending and developing a reputation? The key is still, if he ever stopped Pay, paying attention to rewarding his supporters, uh, to running his patronage operation, uh, th he would lose it. But what happens is once everybody is convinced he's the most reliable paymaster in Asia, and by the way, he can negotiate with people on the other side. So within, within the Median M the king's multinational force that was invading Iraq, uh, Cyrus starts out as just being a minor uh, auxiliary chieftain, uh, leading the Persian auxiliary, which is a minor part. But everyone realized he's the most reliable paymaster uh, he's such an honest paymaster that even the, uh, the Babylonians' allies realize that if they uh, t turn traitor and join with the, the, the Median co multinational coalition, that, that Cyrus can be counted on to pay what, what he promised them also. So he starts accumulating larger and larger armies, and the, and the story ends, of course, with him establishing the greatest uh, realm the world had ever seen, the Persian Empire. Uh, so my thesis is political organizations are established by recognized leaders who maintain reputations for reliably rewarding good service among a group of supporters, that is, for careful use of patronage. Uh, so the applications want to understand, it, so this is, this, is, this is about an autocracy, but we want to talk about all regimes, and we, I'd like to talk, I'd like to imagine uh, being involved, if, if we're involved in anything, in a, in a project to, to, to cultivate democracies somewhere, if we're doing anything. Uh, advice first, do no harm, and that's good advice, but if we were acting, we ought to have to think of the principles. Um, but the essential role of patronage is going to be part of it, and you can't airbrush it away. You don't found a state without patronage. Reput reputations as fundamental law is a point I'm going to make, and decentralization, and, 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 and when we talk about democracy, I'll talk about decentralization to promote democratic competition. Uh, let me give another, another mythical anecdote. Uh, actually, this is, this is just to, to give, do something else to focus on the other side of the thesis. Uh, this is a picture, I don't, you probably can't read it, uh, this is actually this is a book uh, from 1180 A.D. Uh, getting much closer in history by Richard Fitznagel, who he and his father uh, were the were the, the crafts w w d created the British Court of the Exchequer under Henry's the first and second in in uh, the 12th century. And uh, historians, when you ask it under the hypothesis that the rise of Europe owes something to political institutions, and you look and you follow that back to try to figure out what in particular were the, the political institutions of England that, that enabled it to become a world power, 
uh, if it wasn't the coastline and the, and the coal, but it was something about its social institutions that enabled it to create vast empires and terrorize people around the world. Everybody who studies this the, seems to agree the court of the exchequer is absolutely central. A century later, parliament evolves, and that's in some ways an extension of, of the court of the exchequer, but the court of the exchequer is the beginning of, of, of rule Britannia, of British institutions, uh, English institutions. And here's a, a modern diagram of what's going on. I really tell, but here, why is the exchequer so called, our informant from, from 1180 tells us. He says, well, it's because it's, the, the, you knew it was about accounting. The, the exchequer is about accounting, and they're doing, working on a, che, on a checkered tablecloth where they're pushing tokens back and forth. But, and it's, the answer is up there, but let me drag it out just for a second here. He says, just like on a checkerboard, there is a conflict in the, che in the exchequer. The court of the exchequer is a scene of a conflict between two principles, just like over a chessboard or checkerboard. And he, he gives you a, a, a long sentence to think about who is the conflict between. The court of the exchequer is the scene of a conflict, and it is absolutely central to social theory and the fundamentals of institutions. And the answer is the treasurer and the sheriff. The treasurer is, they are both agents of the state. But the treasurer is an agent of the central state. The, the sheriff is a governor in those days. He is the governor of the various provinces. So he is an agent of the state in, in the, out in the field. And the relationship between the central government and the provincial government is absolutely of the essential. Or the, the relationship between the top of the, of, the, of the government's hierarchy and lower agents is absolutely the essence of the matter. And so what's going on? The, the, and, and, and what's going on here? There is accounting going on. There are a number of clerks. That's important of course, but there's also, a, the marshal has a seat, the justicier, that's really the prime minister of England, the bishop of Winchester, the chancellor. So a large subset of the most powerful people in England are twice a year supposed to sit at the court of the exchequer and watch as the sheriff and the treasurer settle accounts. Why is that? Why is that the foundations of England? So, oops, I went too far, let's see. Um, so let me give you my theory. Here's the, here, this is, I wanna say, actually, uh, let me suggest that uh, the, uh, let me speak economic ease a bit too much for, mo for just a sentence, and say, when I think about these great problems of, of people taking seriously, as the, as the authors of the counterinsurgency field manual are, taking seriously the problems of trying to, for better or worse, create a state in the most difficult of situations, I want to make the following proposition, that development, economic development, to me is a process, this is in a cartoon sense, standing on one foot, economic development is a process of moving from moral hazard to adverse selection. What do I mean by that? In a poor country, in a desperately poor country, there are lots of investment opportunities. There are lots of ways that if they could just have some more resources, they could live better. The problem is, so there's no question, is there, are there worthwhile investments here? Of course there are. The problem is you can't invest there, it'll get stolen. You can't make a profit as an outside investor, even as a benevolent guy, you can't, corruption is likely to impact the, what, what, the, what the, your funds really deliver. So in, in, in successful societies, control is, is, is of, of, of valuable resources, is, 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 is achieved by a lot of social systems that we, that, and then there's the question of, uh, if I say I've got an investment opportunity, is it really any good? And the, and the adverse selection is about information, but uh, control of, of strategic incentives. So here's my theory, reputational le leadership theory of the state. Government is a network. And just, I think Ashraf Ghani, who was finance minister of Afghanistan after the, uh, the, after the, uh, the, the defeat of the Taliban and uh, ultimately left uh, after, two, after two years for, for, because he, he, he irritated all the international NGOs that were coming in because one of the things he felt he basically attacked them for, uh, what, uh, what, what does he say, uh, that um, the, 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 in his attempt to build a bureaucracy, a, a, an Afghan governmental bureaucracy that can begin to control resources in the country, he's got to compete for educated Afghans with NGOs that are coming in and paying 20 times what he can pay, and he's international donors are setting his pay scale, for example. So the, the essence of the matter, says Ghani, is you can't have a successful society without some kind of national bureaucracy to provide security and, and financial transfers across the country. And uh, that requires educated people. But government is a network of agents with delegated, delegated powers, and some of them, in a bureaucracy, some of them are 
clerks who are controlled by other clerks watching them. But some of them are not. Sheriffs are not. The, the governors, the, the, the medieval sheriff is really a governor. The go, uh, powerful agents of the state have, have great opportunities to profit from their, from their political power. Uh, government agents could profit from abusing their power, so they must, they'll only serve the state correctly in a way that's functional for the society and the state if, if they expect great, greater long-run rewards from good service. Agents' rewards in the hierarchy are going to depend on the judgments of their superiors, and so incentives do ultimately depend on, on top leaders. That's really the Alkian and Demsitz uh, proposition from the year 1972. But, and the, the, the backloader, the government agents have to have back, they have to expect long-run rewards, backloaded rewards. That's from Becker and Stigler's article in the Journal of Law, Legal Studies in 74. Uh, my point is that promises of backloaded rewards to powerful mid-level agents like the sheriffs of, of, of medieval England become a debt that is owed by the state. And the, sheriff, and the, the treasurer and the people at the center you, everybody always has some incentive, if they could, to repudiate their debts. That's just a basic fact. You'd rather not pay your debts. Debts that are owed by the center of the state are owed by the entity that, that, enfor that is the ultimate enforcer of debts. So how the, the state's functioning itself requires that within the state there be some kind of enforcement to, to, to prevent the top leadership from repudiating it. Every, so the princely court, I want to argue, should be understood as a fundamental institution in which the courtiers are monitored. What are courtiers? Courtiers are agent people who go in and out of high governmental positions. And they spend a lot of time, quote, at court, doing courtly things, which is gossiping and watching the king do certain things. What are the most important things that the king is doing? His dispensation of offices and rewards must be done at court because the courtiers, because the only way people can trust the, the, the leader is if they understand that if he ever cheats any one of these agents, I'm not talking about cheating peasants, I'm talking about cheating sheriffs, cheating governors, cheating high government officials, their deal with the center has to be monitored by the others. Yes, that means there has to be a kind of class consciousness among the rulers. You can't have a state without a kind of class consciousness among the high government officials. Okay, that just follows from economics. And what did, what, so what did my mythical Cyrus the Great do? He created a, a group of, of, of captains in the Middle East who, who, who followed him around and watched him dispensing rewards. And, he, and, and as long as he maintains his reputation, if he cheated any one of them and, didn't, and, and kept the rewards for himself or for somebody else to sell, sell the office to somebody else, he would, he, he would lose face with all of them. That, that reputation that he carefully cultivated since he was a little boy visiting his grandfather would be shot. They'd realize he can't trust him better than anybody else and, and his, his empire would fall. So the primary imperative in any political organization is to build and maintain a network of supporters who trust their leadership, and it's a non-trivial problem. That's, so let me look at Bremer's. I think the essence of, of Bremer's theory of, of how to, uh, Bremer expresses the theory. Unlike, unlike uh, Zen Xenophon Cyrus, he's trying to build democracy in Iraq. That's, that's what he says. And I'm not going to psychoanalyze him and guess what he really wants, um, what motivates him. I think he's re as, as sincere as anybody. Um, but, uh, and I think he's a smart guy, but, but what does he say? He says, I've got three red lines, he, he tells uh, um, Colin Powell uh, a few months into his regime. Uh, we must leave behind a pro professional and uncorrupt police force attentive to human rights. We must have an army that's not involved in internal affairs and no militia, and we should pass sovereignty to an Iraqi government that is elected on the basis of, an in of a constitution. The words, in the so basically what he's saying is, Professionalization of the security forces. He's going to indoctrinate security forces to follow rule of law. Just like mm -hmm. you're going to believe in in, in obeying uh, 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 civilian authority, con civilian constitutional authority. He wants to to inculcate those norms at a time, by the way, when there is no civilian, there's no constitution and there's no civilian authority in in in, in Iraq, and yet he still is trying to teach this lesson. So there's something of a fantasy there, but he really took very seriously that the. Iraqi government must be elected on the basis of the Constitution. The Constitution comes first. Law comes first. There's a kind of a chicken and egg question. Where we, you know, we have a constitutional structure of democracy in this country, for better or for, you know, with, 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 its, with all its, its, its virtues and imperfections. Uh, under the rules of our Constitution, we elect leaders. Uh, the leaders enforce the, uh, the rules of the Constitution. Which comes first, the leaders or the, or the Constitution? Well, uh, 
the egg came first before the chicken, and the leaders came first before the, uh, the Constitution. That, that's, uh, and both, both for the same reason, that, um, that uh, self-organizing systems are, uh, have to be uh, able to start small and ramp up at leadership Leader-follower leader networks can have many opportunities in society to, to, to start small and ramp up and, and, and grow, whereas a constitution has to exist in the whole country uh, or it's nothing. If, it's not, if, if a written constitution is not enforced in the whole, is not seriously be, being enforced in the entire country, then, then it's just a piece of paper. So it, it's something, he's just illogical. Ayatollah al-Sistani al -Sistani recognizes that this is a, recognizes this as, as, as a, an apparent ploy to, uh, to have Bremer write the Constitution or supervise the writing of the Constitution. Uh, American history, it, it argues, no, that first you have the elections without a Constitution, and then you, then you write a Constitution. And of course, the United States Constitution was, was written long after we, we had elected leaders before, who were elected to provincial assemblies before the, uh, the revolution, before the Constitution that we now use, um, the elected leaders with reputations. But that begs the question, if it's, where is the Law, if you don't have law, what is the primary law? And the, the argument is the reputation with the, a leader needs a reputation with his active supporters for, for, for exercising appropriate patronage benefits to them, for, for distributing patronage according to understood mm -hmm. principles. And, uh, and that is the primary law, the primary personal constitution in my American Political Science Review paper last year. That's what I, I, I tried to argue, that this is where it starts. Of course there's a law, but it's personal. And in some sense, if our, if our written constitutions are not compatible with the, uh, the individual reputations of our, of our constitutional leaders, then our constitution isn't going to work. Uh, in, a, in a well established constitution, we have politicians who are rising, competing for, high, for power at the highest level, who have for decades been working in the constitutional system, and it would shock their leader, their, 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 their supporters, if they suddenly denied the constitution. So I, I want to argue personal reputation. We take it for granted now, but it be, that, uh, so that to me is. So let me give a, a page of the counterinsurgency field manual, and I, I re this week I decided that, that to tear out what I thought was the best single page. This actually comes from the appendix. It's, uh, um, but it's. It's where there is this wonderful phrase. This is the true meaning of the phrase hearts and minds. Here they, in the appendix, they, they, they reveal, and, and so and I hope this group will, will, will appreciate that the, 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 this is a section in the appendix called Building Trusted Networks. That is the title of, that, of this, this section in the appendix. Uh, and it says, once your, your counterinsurgency military unit settles into the area of operations, your next task is to build trusted networks. And this Children, they tell us, this children is the, is the true meaning of the phrase hearts and minds. This is, these are actual, they're words but excerpted. I've, I've, hearts means persuading people that their best interests are served by the counterinsurgent success. Minds means convincing them that force can protect them and that resisting it is, resistance is useless. Uh, calculated self-interest is what counts. We're not trying to be nice guys, we're trying to get them to sign up. Uh, and then they comment, trusted networks. There's a kind of ambiguity here. And, it, and, and, I, th and I want to criticize the, the field manual for being ambiguous about this. They indicate the trusted networks include local allies, community leaders, and local security forces. They're, they're trying to recruit people into the network of the government, just like Cyrus. Cyrus was not trying to promise everybody in Asia that they'd have a better deal under the Persian Empire. He's got some lieutenants who are going to serve him who are agents of the state. And, and we're trying to get local agents of the state in, in our community, local agents of, of the state that we're trying to establish. As, it's this nation building. Uh, and they're going to be privileged agents, local allies, community leaders, the local security forces. It's an elite, the local elite. But then they talk, they talk about public goods, that we are, we're, going to, we're going to conduct village surveys, find out what the community needs, try to meet them, mo identify, build common interests. This is the true e effort. Everything is secondary. Uh, so they, I think that there's an ambiguity. Are we trying to, to build a network of allies that is pervasive through the society, or are we through public goods trying to get people to look at us fondly? They are very clear that, that, that the, if the population looks at the government fondly, but, but, expect, but is, is afraid, is intimidated by threats of the insurgents, we're going to lose. It, it's not, and they specifically say it, it, it's, it's not whether they like us that counts. I think the compromise, what I think they really mean to say and should be saying, is that we are identifying privileged, a privileged elite, but in order to get that privileged elite to be accepted by the community, we're going to have to help them to provide some public services that will legitimize them so that they will then 
be able to persist as, as, as a privileged elite, we, our forces can then move on to the next village. And they talk about working systematically through social networks to, to do this. Um, I, uh, uh, let me say, I, I, I think the, they talk about pro 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 promoting security and effective governance to establish legitimate rule, professionalism, avoiding corruption and favoritism. And I think where they go wrong is that they lose track of the fact that pat some patronage corruption is, you know, we're in Chicago, we understand, uh, is, is, is unavoidable in any state. I, that, that, uh, that, that I take it from economic principles that, uh, that, that you can't abolish a certain amount of privilege for people who are in power. After the revolution, we'll, you know, the people we put in the vanguard of the revolution, they'll also start profiting uh, and, and, and you can't do it. Uh, which isn't to, be, to I, I, let me postpone for, for, for four minutes uh, the question of uh, can we reduce corruption but, but not abolish it. But the field manual often talks as if the goal is to make this lean, efficient, corruption free uh, a political machine. And yet, uh, David, much of what they do is inspired by David Galula's uh, S, uh, pamphlet written in the 1964. And uh, David Galula says at one point, you know, Again, to summarize the whole thing that I've just told you while standing on one foot, the essence of counterinsurgency warfare is to build or rebuild a political machine from the population upwards. And uh, elsewhere in the, uh, in, in the book, he also comments and he says, political machines are built on patronage. So um, counterinsurgents and state builders may need a reputation for reliable favoritism, but demanding performance. That's the key. Uh, let me say, I, I, when you think about state building and, and, and counterinsurgency, uh, I think one of the most important articles to me is, 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 is Abhijit Banerjee and Lakshmi Iyer's paper in, in the American Economic Review about, about the Zamindar system in India. They, they, about, about a quarter of India um, is, was, was governed under the British Raj by a, essentially a feudal system. Local feudal lords were, were given Per, hereditary, they, they could sell or, or bequeath to their heirs the power to collect taxes and basically uh, supervise law in a district. Uh, and these rights were given to specific individuals who were co-opted by the British in about a quarter of India. Where did they do it? What you find is they did it in the areas that came under direct British rule early, in, in, when the British were amazingly beginning, you know, from across the ocean, a small island is, is beginning to conquer this country. And after the 1857 mutiny, in the early, before the 1857 mutiny, uh, the utilitarians and others were criticized the inefficiency of creating a feudal regime in, in India and, and, and suggested bureaucratic or, or local council uh, responsibility. And that's what was done in, 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 in another half of India, in half, another quarter of India, it was under, uh, never, never observed, uh, never absorbed under, under traditional rule. So, what Banerjee and, and Iyer find is that the areas of India that were under Zamindar rule, which are to some extent arbitrary, they're concentrated in Bihar and Uttar Pradesh, but they're also distributed where, where for accidents of history came under British rule shortly after the mutiny, they, to this day, you can find higher infant mortality and lower wheat yields, statistically significant. So what does that tell you? It tells you that feudal, a feudal system is a very efficient way of establishing a state but it has long-term consequences that could be part of our heritage today. That is to say that we may find the roots of underdevelopment, for example, in many parts of the world based on feudal systems that were set up by colonial masters as the convenient way of setting up the state. Indigenous uh, military gangs could also want to use the same principle. It's probably the most efficient way to solve the problem. And it does tell you, by the way, that we, we, when, when, when for any reason our, our armed forces get involved in a, in a uh, nation building project, we might be concerned that they may uh, take the temptation of uh, the shortcut of, of, of building a feudal system. Uh, let me, uh, so let me find, talk for five minutes, I think, about democracy. I think uh, I am suggesting the democracies, even in Chicago, uh, cannot abolish a certain level of, of, of privilege for those people who have a serious responsibility for maintaining the great institutions of power in our society. Um, but, uh, 
but obviously as an economist, I, I believe that in, any, in, any, in, in the provision of any service, a certain amount of competition is, is likely to bid down the, the rents. Uh, we may understand that, 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 that our suppliers uh, supply in, in hopes of earning profits, uh, but, uh, and, and, and our suppliers of, public, of political services may as well, but uh, I think for the, for in any country I was going to live in and uh, in any country that I feel any benevolence towards, which I, I, tr I, I think I feel towards most of the world, all the world, I would prefer that they live under, I do believe in a democracy, and, and, uh, and, and uh, that, that's what, but how do you establish democracy? When you decide that, when you recognize that it is, that the cons, writing a constitution is not where it begins, it begins with individual reputations, and if you enter a country, which whatever its history, you have a motivation and a, and a power, which the United States did have in 2003 in Iraq, for example, and in 2004 and five in Afghanistan, uh, 2002 in Afghanistan, um, if, you are, you're, if, if our elected agents are supposed to be trying to create a democracy, we should ask, how do you do it? And there was no debate. There was, as far as I could tell, no practical debate in this country. I know my op-eds never got, never got published. Um, no, one was published because uh, I had a friend who worked for the, for the Minneapolis Star Tribune. I'm sorry. Anyway, uh, sorry about complaining. Okay. Uh, the um, successful democracy requires more... Democratic competition should limit political profits, but it can fail if nobody has a reputation for good governance. You could have a system where whoever we elect, you know, we, we elect the big boss, so, you know, and have a free election, and uh, say, Hamid Karzai is elected president of our country, and he seems a decent guy, but supposing his regime is corrupt, well, there's going to be some corruption because he can't motivate people with, to, to eschew the, 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 the temptations of power without allowing them certain amount of profit taking. He can't do it. Um, there are agency problems, but maybe we feel he's, his government is too corrupt, is too exploitative, is too, uh, well, do we want to get rid of him, we voters? I don't know. Uh, uh, at some point, I think democracies can fail to provide the competition if, if the voters don't trust anybody, uh, and they say, well, we've got this leader who at least knows what he's doing, uh, and, and the, devil, the, other, the other people can talk a good game, but so did he before he was in, in the presidential palace. Um, Successful democracy requires many leaders who have accumulated good reputations, not just for rewarding supporters. They can't be political leaders without reputations for rewarding supporters, but they ought to have reputations for not only providing patronage rewards to their active supporters, but also providing public goods. That's what democracy adds, is, is that the, the, the leaders, our leaders have to mobilize support and then take their supporters and say, well, you're going to enjoy benefits, but only if you, we, you actually work with me in the government to provide some, some of the public services, to do the political job of providing public services. So how do we get the reputation started? And the obvious answer is the institutions can matter. The political decentralization creates more opportunities to create such good reputations. You, a paper that I wrote in the Quarterly Journal of Political Science uh, makes the argument, uh, it gives a formal model of this, that if you you could have a bad equilibrium in a unitary state where nobody bothers, where the, the leader is corrupt and nobody wants to vote against him because they don't, they don't expect any better and, and fear possibly worse from, from, from the unknowns who are, who are opposing. But if you have a, a decentralized democracy where, where there's some delegated power to, to provincial and local levels as well, and there's separate elections to all these levels, people who have been elected to local and provincial office, if everyone was expecting the same bad equilibrium of democracy, a local leader who exceeded expectations, who actually provided some public service, would begin to develop a reputation, would become a contender for rising up to higher office. That's the kind of elasticity of demand for political uh, services that create, sharpens competition. Notice, of course, contrast. Uh, Bremer wanted to start with a national election. It was not until January of 2009 that we at last had a nationwide system, of, missing the Kurdistan, nationwide system of provincial elections. There were provincial elections that weren't held, that were boycotted in the Sunni areas. Um, the provincial elections were finally instituted nationwide in 2009. And what I would have argued, and the, the, all those op-ed pieces that never got published were about, gee, you, what we should be asking Bremer to have local elections all over Iraq, give it, instead of giving the money to Halliburton and other American corporations, let's try to fund as much as possible local councils. Most of them will squander it just as it was squandered by American corporations, but some of them will begin to develop reputations for patronage and, uh, and public service because they'll recognize that's a good strategy. By the way, another, another example of decentralized first is the United States. 
Uh, the Articles of the Confederation was an initial loose federation with, with a very weak central government. We accumulated, this, and of course, before that, there was provincial uh, uh, councils that made the revolution in the first place. Uh, of course, national leaders have an incentive to centralize, to reduce competition. From this perspective, one of the worst things that's happened to democracy in, 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 the, in this decade uh, has been the Russian reform to, uh, to convert the oblast, the governors, into appointees of the president rather than directly elected. And by the way, uh, Xenophon, Cyrus, and, and, and Putin, Putin has many of the same virtues as Xenophon, Cyrus. It's remarkable that almost all the Russian governors trusted Putin to reward them reliably better than their own voters. Some of them were, were genuinely popular and might have been, you might have thought they resist, would have resisted, but they said, no, we know Putin is the guy who's a man of his word um, in this kind of deal. Uh, and uh, that is a virtue of the man, and uh, that is part of, of, of how he has established the new Russian state. Uh, but it is not, it, it is a very weak form of democracy as, because, of, because of the lack of, of uh, any opportunity for people to begin building autonomous reputations, the future candidates who might oppose, uh, who might make a contested election for presidency, would have been people who have had independent reputations from the provinces, and they've just shortcutted that. Uh, let me say, in terms of de development, and this is my response to uh, to Jeff Sachs, uh, the building infrastructure. We should be, from this perspective, this is I'm giving a perspective which is. Poor countries are poor because whatever the history that caused them to have dysfunctional leadership and social institutions, that, that's a large part of what, what keeps, I believe, most of the poor countries in, in, in mired in poverty. Uh, if, if donors are hoping to, uh, to, to, to improve uh, life in poor countries, a better social structure, and this is, this is of course, uh, Ashraf Ghani's argument, uh, the, the proposition, Building infrastructure, building wells, building schools, uh, may be less important, obviously in, in emergencies, when people are dying from, from, a, from, a, from an earthquake, services matter. But in, the long, in anything other than that, I would suggest helping to build social capital is more important. And for that, the question is how, do you, how, do, how could donors constructively increase the supply of leaders whom people can trust with public funds? by distributing money with local responsibility. It's who you give the money to. Much money should be given to the central government to give it a chance to build its networks of, 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 of administration, but, but encouraging political decentralization to, to, so that, that local and provincial governments can also apply for international NGO funds and also a certain amount of, of, of NGOs within the country who are, should be receiving funds, international funds, with a I, an eye on precisely the political, that, they, that the people who, who spend public funds, when the, and the accountability, of course, is not to the, to the world donors, but to the people who, the, in the recipient nation. They need to know how much a do, their, 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 their agents in and out of the government have received from foreign, foreign uh, uh, donors, what the money was promised for, and then they can see whether these people uh, provided the service, and uh, it becomes an opera. So. Let me just end with, with a, uh, a glance at uh, my attempt to rewrite the uh, uh, um, uh, Galula's summary, one sentence summary of, uh, of, of counterinsurgency theory. Uh, I want to argue, I, or let me say first, uh, successful democracy. Successful democracy, to describe it normatively about, about democracy, I think it's important to say that successful democracy is based on a flexible party system, and that by that, I, but party is important. By flexible, I mean that uh, it's possible to create new parties if the old parties are not delivering services. So, what in the in the uh, con there, I have other papers that, that address the question of what in the constitutional structure can raise barriers to entry against new parties, uh, and a plentiful supply of politicians who have cultivated reputations for public service. Uh, and my my summary to the counterinsurgents is. is is to protect and cultivate responsible local leaders in communities throughout the nation and bring them into a democratic system of national political networks, national political parties that are extending out to reach all, the nation, all of the population. That, that's, that's how I would have described the, uh, the mission for uh, Petraeus' people in, in Iraq and Afghanistan if they're to do the good things that we at least say that they're, here to, that they're there to do. So, I'll stop. Thank you. <laughs> We, because we have a little more time in this session, I actually want to open the floor for some questions for Roger before we go on to Marshall's talk and then have 
a little bit larger space after Marshall's for questions from both. Uh, I see one question. I'm going to actually take the chair's privilege. I see two, but I'll ask the first one, then to Bruce, and then, and then Rochelle. Um, Roger, I'm, I'm very, very interested in the fact that, as you're, as you're arguing, as you're aware, that we're dealing with fundamental social theories. Yeah. So it should apply to all situations. Right. But that, um, then when you frame the talk, you're giving us the framework of dealing in the country. And I want to ask about reputational leadership theory of the state yeah. in another context. Um, and as an anthropologist, you're always looking from the outside in. So I want to talk about mm -hmm. what, if that, I could put the question both abstractly and then in a, in a context. And the context I'll give you first, uh, it's not going to be a rabbit under the hat. I'm thinking about that moment, which we also talked about last night, this Dan Rather moment, you know, why do they hate us? Mm -hmm. And it's a very emotional time. And the question of, the question in abstract terms is, uh, what are the rational options? for the actor, now it's going to be, we're going to get back to the context, because it's a question of interpretation. But the, the abstract question is, what are the rational options for an actor who feels that they've been promised backloaded rewards and there's a debt of the state, when the state's not meeting its debt? Yeah. Because we want to figure out how to deal with that situation in a way that avoids violence rather than encouraging it. Yes. But first of all, we have to figure out, I think about it from a sort of game theoretical. One, one, I mean, one of the things that, J, that Dobbins, uh, Dobbins, James Dobbins' books about nation building emphasizes is uh, there are lots of things that are not, he he's very careful about prioritizing, and there are a lot of things he says are, n are not worth spending money on, uh, stick to the essentials, but one of the essentials is paying for the, d the, the decommissioning of the uh, armies that you're trying to uh, pacify. Uh, don't, don't chintz on that. You're going to be paying some people more than their neighbors, but decommissioning armies and and and, and pay, you know that, that I think that's been a large part of the solution in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, there are a lot of people who are on government payroll who used to be uh, and 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 if, uh, used to be uh, 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 in, uh, parts of guerrilla bands, and uh, they. Um, so you're saying the means of violence will affect how rational violent options are, uh, yeah. and, and the you know ability of networks to be coercive. And, but see, what I'm thinking about, and I know that, as you were saying, from your view... And that, by the way, I assume the way it works is that, is that the, cap, the chain of command in the, in the, in the, in the insurgent force, if it's, if it's co-opted in this way, has to become a chain of command for distributing the benefits. Each guy, each guy is going is to be paying out the money to his former uh, foot soldiers. Right, right. So, so that, because uh, you see, I'm, what I'm trying to get at is that sense of uh, when we hear the uh, 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 spokespeople looking at the history of decolonization, wondering whether there are reputational relationships in the UN world between the decolonized nations and the center when they've been enlisted into a larger international system. And then the citizens of whole states feel that they're not getting the prosperity, they're not getting the opportunities, their life chances are restricted by a decolonization. What are their options? Are there options for them that aren't the violent mm -hmm. options? How would we want to model of course, those? Of course. And, and, and every time in decolonization, you, they're, 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 I think that co colonials, colonial imperial officials, I think are sincere in their sense of grief for their local agents who they've made promises to. Right. I think there's no question that if, if, that if you or I was, was, was a colonial official in, in, say, British Imperial India or Africa, uh, we would begin to feel if the system breaks down the, these local people who are living a pretty good life, but, but part as a deal with us, they're going to lose that, and, and I feel a moral obligation, a personal moral obligation. I, I'm not saying the colonialism isn't an you know, it doesn't no, create an evil structure, right. no, but I'm saying, with the yes, of course that's part of it. Of course that is. It, 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 yeah. it, uh, I think it helps to understand that. Uh, Definitely. Definitely. Now, Bruce, you had a question. And if you would speak to the mic, it'll end up in the uh, sound. I, I think the, the, what is common, is, of course, is that, 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 that they're invited to the, to, the, to the former colonial power. Right. And it, it, we have been rather chintzy with, with, with uh, immigration visas to, uh, to Iraqis, and there's, there's some moral question about that. And, uh, yeah. Thanks. Bruce Lincoln. Um, thanks. As a historian of Achaemenid Persia, I was delighted that you started with Cyrus the Great. Thank you. But I think you misread the text okay. and that it's revealing in ways that are much more useful than the uses you put it to okay. and that point up some contradictions in your analysis. Uh, what, what Cyrus we're is no, forming. Are we talking about Cyrus or are we talking about um, a Xenophon? Ze Xenophon's account of Cyrus. Okay, good. Yeah. Xenophon, not, uh, what, what Cyrus really was, Zen I don't know. Xenophon I'm not, I'm not is describing the formation of an empire. Right. And the move that you identify is precisely the co-optation of indigenous elites 
who are persuaded to serve the interests of the imperial center mm -hmm. because that is the source from which their rewards derive. Yes, yes. And they are located in a mediating position between the local populations yes. and the imperial power. Sure. And they funnel profits to the imperial center, yes. a portion of which are reinvested in keeping them happy. Yes. But the bulk of the profits remain at the imperial center, as Cyrus above all knew. Uh, yeah. uh, that yep. it is the defection of the median elites that he secures in the incident yes. that you yes. narrated. Yes, absolutely. He has no interest in democracy. No, I, and I, I think I, I, the I, contradiction sorry. between democracy was, and empire in what you have neither described Xenophon, is... Xenophon says at the beginning what I said. He says, I'm, gonna, I'm really interested in democracy. Xenophon says, I'm interested in democracy. I'm interested in oligarchy. I'm interested in autocracy. I want to understand, and I want to understand regime change between each of these three categories. But I have to start with the basics, and I'm going to start with the monarchy. That's what, and that's what I did today. And then in the last 10 minutes, I, I talked about democracy. Right. But so what you're Cyrus talking about in terms of the cultivation of reputation of leaders his, his faults, is the his, reputation yeah, yeah. among the indigenous yeah. subordinates who yeah. are, are persuaded to serve the American I, okay, imperial paymaster. I don't know what you call them indigenous. They're, they're, they're people from different, they happen to be people from different areas of Asia. They're, they're the local elites whose yeah, loyalties they, are swayed from their people. They are leaders They of, undercut of local governance bands. in favor of the imperial center. And I think that's an important part of so-called sure. nation building that you've not paid much what, attention no, no. to in your I, description. I'm sorry, I was just focusing on the mechanism that, that the, these elites, whatever you want to call them, needed to trust the center and that the so-called, the virtues, the Socratic virtues that this leader had, the personal virtues that he had that enabled him to do that was a kind of reputational trust. Obviously, I, you know, I, I'm not a fan of the Persian Empire. I'm just trying to understand nation building, that's all. Yeah, I yeah. But within an imperial context, it takes a very specific point. Well, yeah. It, 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 it has to be networked hierarchical at this stage. There, there are a lot of units already in place. Whether the, the, the creation of the Persian Empire was, quote, good or bad for uh, various individuals in there is, 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 is not something that I'm prepared to address. Um, I, I think the, the people of, of Judea thought it was a good thing, but others you know, could thought it was a bad thing. It doesn't, that's not the point. The point was, what is leadership? Typically and, in an empire, the elite profit from the empire. Oh, yes. Typically in a government, the, eight, the high ranking agents of the government profit from their position, whether in, directly through salary or indirectly through other means. And, and an agency theory perspective in my, make, makes me think it's impossible to abolish that. We should, pre, we should prefer systems that will minimize it, get it to its, its, its competitive minimum. And that, that to me is what, is what one should recognize in democracy. Yeah. Michelle yeah, Hi. Um, thank you for your presentation. And um, I'm an anthropologist of the Arab world, and so I sort of approach things. Uh, uh, yeah from different perspectives, and I have two quick comments, I hope, um, that are parts, partly questions. But one, in this whole idea of what you're talking about and linking it to the counterinsurgency manual, there also has been this shift in Washington, um, which I think was a, announced by Condoleezza Rice in January 2006, of, of transformational diplomacy, and where USAID became subsumed under and an arm of the State Department. And so I think that's also a kind of a, a very important component in this. And I know you're talking in theoretical terms, and as an oh, anthropologist, I'm going to sort of talk in more practical terms, but I think that sure. really kind of adds to what you're saying in this nation building exercise where, where that's part of it. And I have a second comment, but oh, you good. seem to want to say something. No, no, I, 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 it's a moral hazard at the, at, at the center of the donor we need to talk about. Yes, go ahead. And I'll, the other, I'll say right the other um, thing is I'm working on a, a fairly large and, much, and rapidly growing project on the idea of culture in the US military vis-a-vis um, -vis Iraq specifically. Mm -hmm. And I did a whole series of interviews with U.S. soldiers, of, soldiers and Marines about this subject of cultural training and culture. And after thinking about this quite a bit and working with it um, on one of, with one of my graduate students who was in the military, I've really noticed something that you're talking about from individuals on the ground who are serving in Iraq, uh, Americans. And they bring a very strong notion of what it means to be patriotic to your country mm -hmm. and what it means to have what you know your sense of nation and your sense of state and so these soldiers and marines really believe that iraqis should have these same feelings towards their state and they have no sense of what the state meant for to iraqis they only come with an idea of what the state means to americans and of course yeah. so you know iraq was an incredibly centralized state and it had its fingers in every iraqis lives 
providing education, providing health care, providing food subsidies, providing whatever jobs, providing all those sorts of things, as well as making them serve in the army and putting them in jail and all of the other things that a repressive state did. So when the Americans came in and Bremer dissolved elections, it wasn't that he never had them. I mean, they were no, scheduled no, no, to agree. happen. It's and, horrible. So horrible that, all he, that they, they did. That he canceled the elections. The right, commanders right. had, the, for my money, right. the right instincts, yeah. Right. So that to suddenly have an absent state, and yet the military, the American military expects Iraqis to be loyal to this state and be patriotic to the state that is absent, and, and the American governmental system is saying, is kind of wishy-washy about whether there's an, an Iraqi state or not because of all this talk about you know, federalism and these sorts of things. So you have this, this, this vacuum there where the military on the ground have these certain expectations of Iraqis, and Iraqis are acting in these very self-interested ways because they need things like food and security and education for their children. Absolutely. So I think in some senses what you're saying about American ideas really reflect also on, in terms of American individuals' responses to what's going on in Iraq. Um, I, I, no, I agree. I think, I think legitimation, to, to, I want to use the word legitimation to, to, to the, how do we, I, let, let me, let me, go, let me start from the, the, the response starting from the, 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 the Cyrus the Great story, because he, besides his, his reputation for, excuse me, for justice, he does have another attribute, and that is he's, he's kind of royal. He's not, he's not very royal, but he's just royal enough. And what do I mean by that? He's got an inherited position that is recognized as making him the kind of person who could attract uh, uh, some, some, he's, People expect him to have, people, have, have, have guys working for him and, and fighting for him uh, in, in, the, in a larger context, and he has a place in... So he, he's qualified to be a, rec, a, a recognized leader. How we, at some level, to, to me as a game theorist, there's a big coordination game. We all have to agree who are the leaders or we're going to have civil war. And, uh, and in some sense, this is, a, this is a game with multiple equilibria, and we could all identify in a royal family or... or uh, well. In every society, there are local cultures uh, in America and everywhere else uh, that determine what are considered to be the kinds of people and the kinds of behavior that, 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 that uh, a, a, a legitimate, uh, a recognized legitimate leader, uh, sh sh uh, that can determine a recognized legitimate leader. And, uh, and, and there's no question Paul Bremer was completely tone deaf to... Uh, uh, to symbols of legitimation that are absolutely critical. If people don't think that his if he picks people who aren't going to be viewed as as as, as potential leaders, uh, then they aren't going to be leaders. No, if, if all the good virtues that, that Cyrus could have had if he was a nobody who couldn't even get get the first war band to follow him, uh, he would have he, he would have he would have stayed in in the mountains of Persia. Um, so so symbols of legitimation are are vital. There's no question about that. That's what I recognize. This, by the way, going back to your question, I think the, I have a vested interest as, as, as an economist in, 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 in principles that are, in some sense, culture-free. Those of us in the room who have, who have a methodology that is about, about studying different cultures uh, want to differentiate cultural. To me, the place of culture is where we start identifying candidates for leadership. Uh, the, 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 all cultures, I think, there's still a competition even within a royal family uh, of what's going to determine the actual leader, and there's a, there's a further game to be played, but who are the candidates before the, the competitive game is played is important. Let me just say about USAID, there are, is moral hazard at the center? One of the good questions that I thought a lot about is why should USAID be separate from state? And ultimately, it, I've emphasized that if, if assistant for, for nations that are poor as nations that are because there's something with a society that makes the whole nation desperately poor and about a sixth of humanity now lives in such nations by general accounting if we're to help them and maybe we can't i've argued we're going to have to do something that, that is like building a political system it's bu building political reputations in the country in, a, in an appropriately balanced decentralized competitive way that's what i was arguing for but that means we're getting politically involved. That can also be used, manipulated for our American national purposes, such as let's put in power stooges of our country. So we may we may feel if 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 it is if it is in America's interest that a country should not be suffering, that is to say, to get people such as Somalia out of out of the, the worst chaos of of, of 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 national breakdown. If it is in America's interest to help in a nation building project, we may need to be able to commit ourselves to not manipulate it for American short term interests. And for that purpose, having a, a cadre of people, of professionals in USAID who are separated from the State Department, which is supposed to be articulating you and, 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 and working for US interests, may be important. 
it's not a very good, working through international NGOs or at least working, maybe, maybe we should work in NAFTA in, in conjunction with Canada, that would be my solution, is having Ameri USAID be internationalized with Canada and Mexico and then they could blow the whistle on us if we use it too manipulatively. Yeah. I have been in your position and uh, so I'm sympathetic. They are in favor of an indirect rule. The problem is that once you face uh, the end of that colonial rule, both direct and indirect rule have the same problems. They create a dependency on the ruler. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so uh, th this yes. seems to me that in, in, from an African perspective, yes. uh, the problem of this discussion seems to, uh, 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 seems to be the future. Uh, Mozambique has, has been surprisingly successful since the end of the Civil War. Do you think, no, don't believe it? It's, it's, it we, were expecting, we were expecting it to be one of the wor nation's worst basket cases, and it's at least out of that category, I think. But uh, you're, you, know, um, you know better. I, I, uh, I think the point is, is, I think you're saying, as, as Ashraf Ghani did, that, 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 that building indigenous, that there, are, there are statistical regularities that suggest that, that most of foreign assistance may have actually done harm and uh, some may have helped, but, but statistically, nations that receive aid don't seem to have benefited from it. And, uh, and if it's undermining their, their, their growth of their indigenous, their, their local political institutions that, 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 that uh, successful societies uh, require, then of course that would be a, a natural mechanism for it, where benevolent outsiders who are, whether or not they're tempted by evil outsiders. I should, let me just say one thing before I see the floor, which is that I have, I have not said anything about uh, the, the, the dysfunctional nature of American interventions when they are not accompanied by articulation of limits on American power uh, and, and uh, that, it is an, that I've written at great length about how anything that America does internationally using its economic and military power w that fails to articulate internationally verifiable limits on that use of power will be dysfunctional and cu counterfunctional from American perspective. I've said nothing about that, but this is a good critical Thank audience and I didn't want people to think that I hadn't addressed that somewhere else, but not today. I see the Thank floor. You, Thank you, Roger. Marshall Solomons. Well, um, I do agree with Professor Meyerson about criticizing the uh, counterinsurgency field manual. I also uh, cite the classics, in this case Thucydides more than Xenophon. I think that's where the resemblance ends. <laughs> uh, and uh, especially t talking of classics, mine is much less platonic. Uh, the title of the paper is uh, the Anthropology of the Counterinsurgency Field Manual. The plagiarism is symptomatic of the claims of the so-called military intellectuals to rewrite the book on counterinsurgency. In the same way that the authors of the U.S. Army and Marine Corps' Counterinsurgency Field Manual stake their academic credentials on a pastiche of platitudes cribbed without acknowledgement from social science sources, the manual is devious and dubious throughout. And I, here I pay my respects to David Price, who exposed the plagiarism in a fantastic article in Counterpunch. The originals of the unattributed passages range from eminences such as Max Weber, Victor Turner, Anthony Giddens, and T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence, through online encyclopedias to journeyman anthropology and sociology textbooks. Deeply complicit in this lack of academic integrity is the University of Chicago Press, which published the trade edition of the manual in 2007, following the advice of a so-called peer review group drawn from policy and think tanks. But no matter, the media blitz surrounding the publication and sales in the top 100 on Amazon have afforded the press the consolation of making a profit without honor in its own country. You didn't get that? I'll say it again. I'm here all week, uh, you know. <laughs> Flogging the counterinsurgency field manual to the public is a telltale sign of its most ambitious duplicity, that apart from its operational value, between the pseudo-military covers is a propaganda tract at least as useful in the clandestine battle being waged in the Heimatland. Ever since the fateful debates among the citizens of Athens during the Peloponnesian War about how to deal with rebellious allies cum imperial subjects, the counterinsurgency wars of democratic republics have been fought on two fronts. 
Beside the insurgents in other countries, the US military is engaged with a potentially formidable opponent of which the manual seems well aware, but uh, never mentions the general will of the American people. Not that it need be mentioned, since it is sufficiently repeated elsewhere in military annals that the Vietnam War was inadequately fought and ultimately lost because of mounting opposition at home. The decisive hearts and minds the US strategy failed to win. In connection with Iraq, the political opposition was aggravated by the periodically shifting and always disingenuous reasons the erstwhile commander-in-chief, George W. Bush, put out for why so many Iraqis and Americans had to die, including the tendentious conflation of counterinsurgency with a global war on terror. Hence, the unusual public offering of a coin manual that de-emphasizes the combat and bypasses the politics for an anodyne description of counterinsurgency as a planetary project of applied anthropology with the apparent objective of adding the number of lives saved to the total of those subjugated. In Vietnam, the famous anti-insurgency strategy was search and destroy. Here it is research and destroy. One might think it good news that the military's appropriation of anthropological theory is incoherent, simplistic, and outmoded, not to mention tedious. Even as its ethnographic protocols for learning the local society and culture amount to unworkable fantasies. Except that, as Andrew Bigford has pointed out, the bad anthropology of the manual's boilerplate premises could only prolong the fighting and increase the mourning. Indeed, the fighting would be prolonged if only because it would take years to do the research that the manual prescribes. What the manual prescribes is that military staffs and in some measure personnel at all echelons must understand the people. We've just heard a question about this. It's relevant. To understand the people, they need analytic knowledge of so-called six socio-cultural factors. Society, social structure, you can already see the incoherence. The society is different from social structure. <clears throat> Culture, language, power and authority, and institutions. They have to know all of these things. To understand the social structure, they will have to know the existing groups, institutions, organizations, and networks. Institutions now reappearing in two places. Groups are defined as two or more people who interact on the basis of shared expectations of behavior and have interrelated statuses and roles. To identify relevant groups inside and outside the area of operations, the commanders of the combat unit should be supplied with information on formal relations between groups, informal relations between groups, divisions and cleavages within groups, and cross-cutting ties between groups. And then, after similar mapping of institutions, organizations, and networks, the military staff should, quote, identify and analyze the cultures of the society as a whole and each major group with, within the society, end quote. This minor research proposal includes <laughs> inquiry into how the world is categorized, as well as prevailing values, beliefs, core, intermediate, and peripheral, attitudes, perceptions, identities, norms, codes of behavior, rituals, symbols, ceremonies, myths, narratives, taboos, and something called cultural forms, which are, quote, concrete expressions of belief systems, end quote. Then, having mastered the social structure and the culture, I'm not sure exactly what happened to the society rubric. Quote, staffs must determine how power is apportioned and used within a society, end quote. No need to go into the other imaginary research agendas, such as learning the local languages and the people's interests. The fact is, it would take many anthropologists with many years of training and even more years of fieldwork to do all this, by which time pretty much everything would be different especially at the tactically relevant level of appearances. Among the other things that the military intelligentsia don't understand about anthropology is that it is the only discipline, apart from high energy physics, that is committed to the study of disappearing objects. Moreover, being operational, much of this cultural knowledge has to be acquired by low-level combat forces. Exactly how much and what kinds the manual does not specify but presumably enough to engage and manipulate the people for better or for worse. 
Given the already demonstrated ineptitude of human terrain specialists, we'll probably hear more about that later in the conference, the soldiers' instructors are also likely to be mediocre. The new counterinsurgency doctrine turns out to be a hopelessly disorganized course in introductory anthropology offered by inept professors to academically challenged students in a combat zone <laughs> who will presumably ace the multiple choice final exam by guessing at the right answers and shooting the alternatives. <laughs> now multiply this cockamamie anthropology by the thousand US military bases on foreign soil and the planetary scope of the Pax Americana. There will be a fair amount of information-based killing, writes Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Peters, an influential expert on urban counterinsurgency. I quote, there will be no peace. The de facto role of the US Armed Forces will be to keep the world safe for our economy and open to our cultural assault. To these ends, we will do a fair amount of killing. We are building an information-based military to do that killing, end quote. So then, whose side are you on, Petraeus? Although the COIN manual, counterinsurgency manual, pretends to be based on up-to-date social science, it lacks the critical reflexivity of the latter, since what it dare not address is the Americans' own presence as an invading and occupying power. Rather, the text presupposes that the invasion of other countries by US military forces is a good thing, since it treats all resistance or insurgency a priori as the enemy. The covering definitions of insurgency slyly couple the control of an occupying power with the defense of a legitimate government. Insurgency, according to one definition in the manual, is, I quote, an organized movement aimed at the overturn of a constituted government through the use of subversion and armed conflict, end quote. And according to another definition, an organized protracted political military struggle designed to weaken the control and legitimacy of an established government, occupying power, or other political authority while increasing insurgent control, end quote. The imperialist hubris of the manual, however, goes beyond the unapologetic complacency with American intervention and occupation. Since the aim is the control of a civilian population that the so-called legitimate government is unwilling or unable to accomplish, counterinsurgency as such becomes a form of American governmentality. Sarah Sewell of the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, who <clears throat> makes that point in her brilliant and morally tortuous introduction to the University of Chicago edition of the manual. I quote, the field manual stresses the importance of effectively employing non-military power. It is not a responsibility that can be left to a beleaguered host nation. Counterinsurgents must harness the ordinary administrative functions to fight, providing personnel, resources, and expertise. This is where the AID gets into the State Department, gets into Iraq. In other words, politics as a, as a continuation of warfare by other means. In US counterinsurgency, imperial dominion is a battleground tactic. In the counterinsurgency manual of the Network of Concerned Anthropologists, soon to be published by the excellent Prickly Paradigm Press, <laughs> Gregory Feldman observes that the COIN manual is, quote, the COIN manual's, quote, historical examples of counterinsurgency practically make the argument themselves that Machiavellian concerns with stability prevail over moral problems of occupation, end quote. You will find no pro-insurgency doctrines here, no reflections either on American support of the French resistance during the Nazi occupation, or the CIA's complicity with Muslim forces, including a certain Osama bin Laden, fighting the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. The apparent exception that proves the rule is a programmatic appendix entitled A Guide for Action, which closely parallels without acknowledgment a text by T.E. Lawrence on promoting Arab resistance to Ottoman rule, but is here perversely turned into a primer of counterinsurgency. One gains the distinct impression that were the counterinsurgency field manual available, copies of it could be found in the haversacks of the British troops of Lord Cornwall engaged in suppressing the American Revolution. Still, a worse anachronism 
is that the counterinsurgency manual in the modern American soldier's kit is indeed derived from British colonial practice. Coin doctrine, writes Sarah Sewell, is based on principles learned during Britain's early period of imperial policing and relearned during responses to 20th century independence struggles in Malaya and Kenya. The coin manual draws, also draws salutary lessons from Napoleon's occupation of Spain and his failure to, com to cope with the liberation, liberation struggle of the Spanish guerrillas, as well as from French strategy, uh, strategies of colonial warfare in Algeria, Madagascar, and Indochina. Need some water. At least this is not Fiji water. Uh, but we too have ancestors. The manual follows on a long history of American intervention and suppression of anti-colonial uprisings in Cuba, the Philippines, Vietnam, El Salvador, Nicaragua, the Dominican Republic, and the territory now known as the United States. The only novelty is the explicit cultural assault, the military intellectuals' quixotic programs for culturally leveraging a Pax Americana by engaging anthropological expertise including uniformed human terrain systems anthros in combat and intelligence operations of an imperialist vintage. It is, however, a credit to their chosen field and to David Price, Robert Gonzalez, Hugh Gusterson, and all who edited the Counter-Counterinsurgency Manual that for the great majority of anthropologists, the integrity of other people's existence is at once an intellectual premise of their discipline and its ethical imperative. They will not put the peoples with whom they live and work at the risk of bodily harm, foreign domination, or cultural disintegration. Yet inasmuch as the American national interest is the, is the decisive strategic interest of counterinsurgency practice, morality in respect of the local population is always subject to expediency. The only apparent exception is when tactical advantage can be gained from the humanitarian treatment of certain groups, in which case morality itself is expedient, if still heedless of justice. The principal role of academics in the service of coin is to develop the human intelligence that will allow a triage between those elements of the population to be attacked and those that would be better not to, in brief, sophisticated targeting. But in these matters, US interests are privileged over what may be just or good, as Sarah Sewell laments. I quote, the coin dictum of enhancing host nation legitimacy, she writes, may require severely compromising Western notions of justice. And again, it is painful then to see the field manual grapple with lessons from Iraq because the manual can't state the obvious, that imposing a revolution from outside provides a weak and illegitimate basis from which to defeat an insurgency. Once committed, the United States is harnessed to a beast that may prove impossible to tame. U.S. actions aim to enhance the host government's legitimacy and help it become independent. But what if the government isn't good or brave or wise? Yet if the government isn't good, its enemies, who are by that token U.S. enemies, could very well be. The dilemma becomes all the more painful because a major effect of, American, of the American intervention in Iraq, as can be expected when they coup d'etat by a foreign force is then legitimated by the installation of a proxy democratic regime, the major, <clears throat> the, the major effect has been to turn a plural society of different ethnic, tribal, and religious groups into a factionalized state of nature. In the ensuing all-out competition for political and economic power, the differences are remade into non-negotiable antagonisms as motivated by irre irreconcilable causes to die for. Long-standing local-level hostilities are reconfigured in the terms of the larger conflicts in which they have been embedded. Refashioned morally and tied politically to global conflicts, local differences, which once may have been resolvable or at least tolerable as working misunderstandings, become vulnerable to outbursts of trans transgressive violence. Stuff happens, as Donald Rumsfeld famously said. The very notion of a Hobbesian state of nature arose out of just such a conflation of local difference and global conflict. 
Thomas Hobbes was the first translator of Thucydides directly into English. Classical and Hobbes scholars alike have seen in Thucydides' famous description of the bloody civil strife or stasis at Corcyra, that's Corfu, motivated as he claimed by, a natural, by natural human desires of greed and ambition, they've seen in that the source of Hobbes' conception of a state of nature. Time will not be permit a detailed recounting, only enough to indicate that it takes a lot of culture to make a state of nature. Civil discord was already endemic in the Greek cities before the Peloponnesian War, as both Aristotle and Plato observed, but it was magnified and generalized when it was conflated with the Panhellenic conflict between Athens and Sparta. At Corcyra, these greater powers intervened when an uprising of the few or privileged class against the ruling democratic many threatened to sever the city's allegiance to Athens by establishing an oligarchic regime allied instead with Sparta. The conflict unfolded in a series of violent clashes involving also sacrilege against law and religion, inflicting casualties that mounted progressively when, Spartan, when the Spartan and, and Athenian fleets intervened in turn on behalf of the oligarchic and democratic parties. In the end, 60 Athenian ships established a cordon around the city, whereupon the partisans of the oligarchy suffered bloody massacre at the hands of an out of control democratic mob. Death then raged in every shape, as Thucydides said. A close reading indicates that it did so by confounding personal ambitions, private envies, and pre-existing quarrels with the great public causes of the larger war, the democratic equality promised by the Athenians or the moderate oligarchy backed by the Spartans with the promise of freeing the city from Athenian imperialism. Hence the larger implication of slavery versus freedom, which helps explain why the construction of the Peloponnesian War as a showdown of the antithetical regimes of democracy and oligarchy is actually first attested in Thucydides' description of the civil war at Corcyra. Moreover, and this is critical, such things are recounted by Thucydides as creditors being slain by their debtors for, quote, crimes of attempting to put down the democracy. You have to read Thucydides very closely. Creditors are slain by their debtors for the imputed crime of putting down democracy. You can see the logical connection. I mean, creditors are to debtors as rich people are to, to the demos. <laughs> but, uh, but are creditors, in fact, uh, in, in, engaged in the crime of putting down democracy? Persons who were once rivals and perhaps neighbors have been turned into monsters. The violence was transgressive because the specific relations of the adversarial parties had been redefined in the transcendent terms of the larger conflict, thus resolving their local identities into global enmities. The light can be discovered in the modern forms of the Corcyrian state of nature, notably among post-colonial plural societies in South Asia, Africa, the Middle East, and Indonesia. Vina Das's influential study of the massacre of a Sikh community in West Delhi following the assassination of Mrs. Indira Gandhi by her Sikh bodyguards begins from the observation that the slaughter was selective and engaged factions that were already at odds. Other local Sikh groups escaped with few or no deaths, in some cases because of the protection offered by Hindu neighbors. The targeted, the targeted Sikh community, however, had been unusually wealthy, and their ostentatious display of it aroused the pure, poor Hindu group that eventually murdered them. Not to neglect that the Sikhs had built a temple on land the Hindus considered theirs, and perhaps decisive, the headmen of the two communities, whose drunken exchange of taunts triggered the bloodbath, had been competing for the patronage of an important Congress party official and the access to state resources that this would have given them. In the wake of Mrs. Gandhi's death, the state became engaged on behalf of the, of the Hindu faction, and its power in the form of the police, supposedly implementing the law, actually aided the assault on the Sikhs. Neither good nor brave nor wise, government entered the fray as an instrument of partisan terror. But then the whole tragedy was played out as the vengeance of the nation the Hindu assailants casting themselves 
as sons of Mrs. Gandhi and, her, and their victims as her assassins. Blood must be avenged with blood, they cried, and you have killed our mother, end quote. The imposition of democracy in post-colonial plural societies, especially by an external force majeure, does not resolve such schisms so much as it creates them. When the American invasion made Iraq a regional battleground in a global war against terror, or terrorism as George W. Bush calls it, instead of terrorism, terrorism. <laughs> the moral and material issues of local politics were magnified in proportion with the destabilizing consequences of accumulating the inequalities and the consequent brutalities. There is a direct relation between the planetary scale of the conflict and the cosmic claims of the competing ideologies, Christianity versus Islam, Muslims versus infidels, democracy or tyranny, or in George W. Bush's brilliant analysis, the ultimate battle of good and evil. Having thus become abstract, universal, unconditional, and existential, the moral opposites are accordingly lethal. As we have just seen, when infiltrated into local relationships, magnifying them in terms of demonic identities, such transcendent causes inspire transgressive violence. Torture, Abu Ghraib, suicide bombings, rendition, beheading, collateral damage, the horror, the horror. As the morality of the material wealth and political disorder introduced by the American invasions, the effects are all the worse. It has been said that underdeveloped countries with American help never develop. In something of the same, that was funny, I don't know. In something of the same way, installing a post-colonial democracy under American aegis exacerbates the sectarian divisions by ever-shifting correlations of the international national and sectarian forces. For want of a better portmanteau term here, I use sectarian to refer to ethnic and tribal divisions as well as schismatic religious differences. Electoral politics, as many studies in South Asia have shown, factionalize, polarize, essentialize, and primordialize the differences among ethnic and religious groups. Reducing political power to sectarian demography, demography, they put minority communities at the mercy of the majority. The coalitions that are then encouraged among the disparate blocs turn out to be fragile and ephemeral, dissolving in the case of electoral defeat or fracturing over the distribution of power and plunder that are the spoils of victory. Indeed, by putting the might and resources of the state at the disposition of the partisan group that has captured the government, the victory gives them the means of further weakening their communal enemies, either by using patronage to win over certain constituencies or else, to for, or else force to intimidate, incarcerate, or eliminate them. Many of these so-called democratic tactics will undermine traditional relations of solidarity and authority, both within as well as between the sectarian blocs. Hence, their overall effect is to increase the total quantity of social animosity. Taken together, they amount to a process that might be ambiguously and usefully described as the fatalization of difference. But whether fateful or, faith or fatal, whether fateful or fatal, the outcome is rendered all the more probable by the intervention of outside powers bent on exploiting the local divisions for their own ambitions. With regard to the provincial elections just mentioned, uh, as I, there's a footnote here that says, I write this on the morning of, of April 16th. Look how far in advance it. A story appears in the New York Times that begins, quote, Iraq's provincial elections in January, that was January 31, promised something still rare here, hope for the democratic process. What has happened since then is something more familiar to Iraqis. Threats, intrigue, backroom deal making, protests, political paralysis, and increasingly popular dissent and discontent, and he doesn't mention the violence, which I'll get into in a minute. According to various sources about this election, incidentally, some 300 new political parties participated in them, plus dozens of established national and regional parties, and an untold number of lo older local ones. On average, there were more than 30 candidates for each provincial seat. Talk about fractionalization. <coughs> 
And only about 45% of the eligible voters went to the polls for reasons that you'll see in a, in a minute. In the national communal conflicts of South Asia, such as Vina Das, Stanley Tambaya, Bruce Keffer, Jonathan Spencer, Michael Roberts, and others described, the economic advantages, advantages of power are surely significant. But at local levels as well as the national, they are derisory by comparison with the stakes put in play by American counterinsurgency strategies in Iraq. The patronage for which the parochial headmen in West Delhi were contending could give them the rights to profitably dispose of immigrant labor contracts, passports, land titles, and the like, while the ensuing enrichment of one faction and the disenfranchisement of another had unsettling effects that were palpable enough. They were nothing in comparison to the discriminatory opportunities offered to Iraqi tribal, religious, and government leaders by US development projects involving millions and millions of dollars. Laterally, this has been complemented by outright bribery, as in the so-called awakening movement. Payments made all the more effective by the failure of development projects to provide employment or basic public services. I am not saying that the American inability to provide jobs or electricity has been purposeful, but only it is that it has been useful in making selective bribery the more effective. Poverty is an enabling condition of the loyalty effects of discriminatory bribery, even if it also guarantees the increased resentment of those not favored. In any case, unemployment in Iraq is running at something like 20 or 30 percent of those wanting work. 60 percent of the employed are in the government sector, which rather ensures job discrimination by sectarian affiliation. I, for, I forbear then from comment on the boondoggle for the American corporations in the game, except to note that many have imported foreign laborers to work at 50 cents an hour. Crying corruption, the Iraqi losers are often groups of ancient standing who are being sidelined by their foreign-backed nouveau riche compatriots. Quote, when the Americans began, this is from a recent news article, when the Americans began paying foreman, former insurgents and tribal leaders to help enforce security, reads a recent report from Anbar on the run-up to the January elections, quote, they favored some tribes over others in many cases, displacing the old ones for upstarts. In the event, the coming election was not so much a democratic turning point as a sectarian crisis attended by fears of violence, especially in regard to the aftermath. As for democracy, the report continues, now the tribes are jockeying for power and people here, people here complain bitterly that the machinery of democracy is gilding corruption, internal rivalries, and an intense feudal instinct sick, that regards electoral office as a bigger cut of the provincial resources and security forces. <clears throat> Consider the case of Sheikh Ahmed Abu Risha, whose brother, an awakening leader, was betrayed by his bodyguard and killed by a suicide bomber in 2007. As a rival sheikh complained, um, uh, complained, Ahmed inherited the awakening and turned it into an enterprise of deals and contracts. Another of Sheikh, of sheikh Ahmed's critics, incidentally, is known locally as the whale for the amount of American aid he has swallowed. Sheikh Ahmed now lives on an extensive estate guarded by Iraqi army and police checkpoints. State power as a private militia, something many tribal leaders avidly desire. In his sumptuous spread, the Sheikh keeps a stable of Arabian horses, a camel farm, caged fawns, a fleet of armored SUVs, and a pink mansion, presumably maintaining contact from there with his trade and investment companies in the UER, while he pushes for a local natural gas project worth billions of American dollars and dreams of turning Anbar into another Dubai. Before the American invasion, however, Sheikh Ahmed's tribe was not among the most powerful or honorable of the region. Now, with the election upcoming, he was suspected of overtures to the dominant Iraqi Islamic party, an adversary of the tribes with a large reputation for corruption in its own right. According to a later report, the Sheikh's alliance with the party came to pass 
which meant that he had indeed abandoned the awakening for which his brother was martyred. Everything he thus indicates that by adding corruption and betrayal to inequality and envy, the several modes of counterinsurgency bribery stoked the fires of sectarian differences with the fuel of class hostilities. The ominous turmoil that developed over much of Iraq before and particularly after the January 2009 elections, including the resurgence of hardline Baathists and jihadists, is generally attributed to the anticipated withdrawal of US forces. What the explanation misses is the countrywide factionalization promoted and subsidized by six years of US occupation, a political failure that made the American decision of leaving or staying on the choice between an end with misery or a misery without end. For a notable example, what is missing is that the vaunted American-backed awakening movement is a failure verging on catastrophe for the Iraqis who participated in it. Although for something like two years the awakening helped diminish the, diminish the bloodshed, the increasing discord among the tribes themselves now made them vulnerable to renewed violence on the part of Islamic extremists and political neutralization on the part of the central government. America has been sort of an, an equal opportunity lever in the lurch in Iraq. In the first uh, Gulf War, they left the Shia in the lurch. And in the second Gulf War, they're leaving the Sunni in the lurch. And the Kurds better keep themselves on guard. <coughs> um, <coughs> preoccupied by their own internecine hostilities, the leaders of the awakening movement have been subject to assassination by the extremists and incarceration by the government. Speaking of the secret arrests of tribal leaders, a high-ranking American official in Iraq observed that the central government, I quote, apparently has its hand in the sectarian cookie jar. The Sunni have been the primary victims, of course, adding their complaints about the large numbers who remain in detention despite an amnesty law that should have freed them to their grievances about exclusion from the national government, their inability to serve and uh, secure employment, and the failure to integrate the awakening in the Iraqi army. Both Sunni and Shia, however, have suffered from Prime Minister al-Maliki's autocratic policy of extending government, central government control by creating new phony tribal councils reporting directly to his office and paid from his budget. The same kind of dispute between central and provincial power has rendered the relations between the PM's Dawa party and its ally, the Supreme Council of Iraq, I quote a report, acrimonious and confrontational. In the recent elections, Mr. al-Maliki gave his support to the main opponent of the Supreme Council in central and southern Iraq. Not that the central government doesn't have its own factional issues. The story going around in Iraq is that the al-Maliki government has indeed succeeded in unifying the country since everyone is fed up with it. That includes members of the highly fractionated government itself, which has been coping with the rumblings of a coup for months. There have been sweeping arrests of persons believed conspiring against the government in Baghdad and Diyala province. 24 members of the Ministry of Interior were arrested recently, apparently for the same reason. True or not, the report that leaders of major factions of the government met secretly in December last to discuss toppling al-Maliki is a reading of the state of the, of the Iraqi Union. So is the mounting violence, including suicide bombing in and around Baghdad. The talk is of the revival of extremist sleeper cells, which is a new awakening indeed, most prominently Al-Qaeda in Mesopotamia, and as before mentioned, a renewed coordination of the Islamic radicals with militant Sunni Baathists led by a cast of notorious characters from the Ancien Saddam regime. In any case, what should be considered violence in the current Iraqi situation, and how much and what kinds of it are acceptable? Consider the government's power to arbitrarily detain its partisan enemies, useful no doubt as a more politic alternative to main force. Or the massive migrations of people in fear of their lives, with ethnic cleansing effects that have made Baghdad, for example, overwhelmingly Shia. Or just the following compendium of fatal incidents in the second week of March 2009, as reported by Iraq, IraqBodyCount.org, a record that is only a fraction of the actual turmoil, as it does not include military casualties, 
civilians wounded or the number of failed attacks. I think I'll just read a couple of those days and I'll, I'll skip on. On 8 March, two police shot dead in West Mosul. Technical Institute sh student shot dead in Mosul. 25 bodies found shot dead in mass graves in Khalis. 32 killed by a suicide bomber on a motorcycle in Palestine Street in Baghdad. Two awakening council members shot dead in Jihad in Southwest Baghdad. Skip to the end of the week. March 14th, the body of a man in his 40s shot dead in the river in Iskandria. I guess that must be the city founded by Alexander the Great. Um, Off-duty policemen shot dead in the al Sarai market in Mosul. Six former detainees, Sunnis, shot dead by police near Haditha. Mosul University professor shot dead in, Mos in al Nur Mosul. Football player shot dead by policemen in Buhayrat, uh, north of Hila. A, <clears throat> a brother of an awakening council leader killed by a bomb attack attached to his, a bomb attached to his car in Baghdad. And so more recent headlines, April 5, 2009, LA Times. A world beyond statistics where killings still ripple through society. Black funeral banners belie Iraq's declining death toll. On April 13, the Independent reported that two days before, a suicide bomber, almost certainly from Al-Qaeda, killed 13 and wounded 30 Sunni paramilitaries in Jabala, 35 miles southwest of Baghdad. All were members of Awakening Councils. In all, an estimated 53 Awakening Council members were killed in the week of April 5 to 12. And I don't know if you saw this morning's headline, but 80 more people were killed and 120 wounded in three bombings in Baghdad, and one in Baghdad and two in Diyala province, including at least one Awakening Council leader. I seem to have gone far off the topic of the counterinsurgency field manual, but that's precisely my point. The manual is largely irrelevant as well as unworkable in regard to conflicts the like of Iraq or Afghanistan. The only thing relevant is the acronym COIN, COIN for counterinsurgency, a term happily, that happily synthesizes the two main strategies of the Pax Americana, neoliberalism and militarism. But their combination has not proved very effective since the costs of each outweigh the benefits to the other. <clears throat> Once again, the military is devising new ways of fighting old wars, stretching back from Vietnam to the cavalry against the Indians. But Iraq is not your grandfather's insurgency. It is not a war of resistance or of national liberation, nor is it a classic civil war. It is many-sided, not two-sided, more like a bellum omnium contra omnis, or rather with its ever-increasing and shifting factionalism, its contending ideologies and reconfiguring identities, its master and subaltern narratives, its hybridization of the global and the indigenous, its permeability of national boundaries, it is in some a postmodern state of nature. True, that description, a postmodern state of nature is a bit oxymoronic, but by comparison, the counterinsurgency field manual is totally moronic. <laughs> All right, I want to begin our final discussion by expressing on behalf of uh, the organizers of the, spon of the conference and the sponsors of the conference, a real gratitude to Roger Meyerson and to Marshall Sollins for coming and speaking in the same session. I've been involved in this university since 1980, okay? And I think you don't have to have been here that long to sort of know that anthropology and economics aren't the same uh, around here. And to my memory, you guys may be able to think of counterexamples this is the first time in about 30 years that I've been at a session where members of both departments, senior members of both departments, are participating in the same discussion. And I think and it's not only some abstruse, extreme, uh, and, and intellectually obscure topic we're talking about. We're talking about very basic political questions and very basic issues in social theory. So I think that there's something very important about their willingness to come and speak on the same panel and that they're not coming from the same place, you know, what that we knew. Uh, now, the floor is open for questions. Well, Marshall hasn't had any questions yet, but I think we could have questions to both, uh, depending upon what people want to ask about. Thank you. 
Well, we're close to it. If you guys really, this is a great opportunity here. Uh, there's a, a. Oh, okay. Definitely, yeah. If you could use the mic, we could have it in the, uh, in the record. Uh, Marshall began by saying that the counterinsurgency manual did not contain a moral point of view. And by implication, he did present uh, a moral point of view of anthropology, which seems to be non-interference. But there are many cases that we could look at. Uh, for example, um, uh, the Sudan and Darfur, um, well, mm -hmm. we don't have to make a list of them, sure. where um, non-interference also has a well, moral downside. And so I wonder whether uh, both speakers could address, really continue Marshall's um, discussion of how outside intervention tends to exacerbate faction that maybe there's a rejoinder uh, that could be made that, well, is there a way in which uh, factions, an outside party, can balance factions off in a way that moderates them rather than exacerbates them? And indeed, one could say that after the Hobbesian war of all against all, that that experience of religious war in England actually led to then uh, a post-Hobbesian vision of version of liberalism of uh, toleration that after a hundred years of each religious representative killing uh, non well their, their, their opponents that led to ideas of tolerance that then uh, uh, led to ideas of pluralism. Mm -hmm. And so are there ways of, of, um, of intervening in a way that does it right? Marshall, do you want to? Yeah. <coughs> well, I was. I would certainly dispute the idea that the counterinsurgency manual has no morality involved in it. It's certainly, since it's devoted to the present uh, insurgencies in Iraq, Afghanistan, and around the world to come, it has a morality uh, 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 which uh, ipso facto, uh, and by its examples of uh, of British colonial uh, action against counterinsurgents, against insurgents, uh, and wars of national liberation, uh, which are taken from the point of view of the colonial country, it ha obviously has a morality. And it's that morality that I was trying to uh, uh, draw out. As far as intervention in other places, uh, that depends on what's, uh, what's going on. I, there sometimes it's not going to uh, solve the problem. It's going to prolong the problem. And in the case, I think, of Iraq and the many others, it will. In, in, in the case of uh, England in, in uh, Hobbesian times, it was not that England was a state of nature and then became a plural society. I mean, Hobbes invented the whole idea of a state of nature. Uh, which, uh, which uh, <coughs> he, uh, he uh, used to argue for an absolute monarchy. So I, I, you know, I don't think that this is an actual historical example of anything. So what else was there? Well, actually, given I've got three, at least three other people who have questions, maybe we should go on to other questions. Um, I've got Rochelle Davis, uh, Matthew Spark, and then Hugh Gusters. Thank you, Marshall, for your uh, presentation. That was really amazing. Um, just to add on to the idea of this, um, the factionalism that America is sort of building on in all of this as it, and, and benefiting from, there's been some really important work done on how 
sectarianism in Iraq has actually been created, um, and, and, and I think it's a, a hugely important thing that we need to acknowledge that perhaps Iraqis have now taken on these sectarian and, fasc and factionalist ideas now, but there was a, a, a definite creation of it. And a um, Norwegian scholar named Visser, right, or Visser, has written about it as well as an American historian named uh, Nabil Takriti. And they've both written about, traced through academia, uh, media, and policymakers how they have created this sectarian narrative and empowered that in Iraq by appointing people who are Sunnis, Shia, or Kurds, mm -hmm. etc. And I think. In building on this more theoretically, I mean, I, I make my students read um, Roger Rogers Brubaker's um, um, Beyond Ethnicity and then Brubaker and Cooper's work Beyond Identity to think of these ideas of sectarianism not as these identity things, but as groups that people coalesce around or you know drop off of and, and sort of, and, and somehow I feel like even academics are not necessarily engaging with these ideas of factionalism, that we see them as natural as opposed to, right. um, and, and it's, yeah. Uh, as I try to say, I mean, I think primordialism itself was created in this situation. And, you know, there are very good studies of the Tamil, uh, <coughs> the Tamil Sinhalese uh, split that began in the th uh, late 20s or early 30s with uh, Proposal, I forgot the name of the Brit who was involved, for common role elections in uh, Sri Lanka. The effect was that the Tamils, uh, the Tamils uh, opted out and the Sinhalese discovered that they were uh, suddenly Buddhists. All these Christian trained Sinhalese elite, it did start with the elite, discovered that they were now uh, uh, Lord such and such Buddhists. Uh, and this was the beginning of the uh, opposition, which of course was exacerbated in further elections uh, and ultimately in the one of 1950, uh, 1981. So uh, uh, yes, I, I believe that there very much that this kind of factionalism is a product of uh, the situation and it's made worse because you know, we're talking about uh, Sri Lanka, you're talking about basically until the Indians intervene, an internal situation. But once you put on top of that, the American global struggle. I mean, it's a global war again, and it involves all of these other countries in the Middle East, as we decide. Uh, then the issues are accordingly abstract and uncompromisable, and they get uh, uh, they they get. Uh, they embed the local op uh, oppositions, which become accordingly uh, tr uh, transcendent oppositions that don't recognize the local relations as local relations and local identities as local identities, but only as the huge kinds of abstract universal enemies. I think it's extremely important to notice this. I mean, the, the classicists have noted it, uh, at least one at W. Robert Connor about about the uh, the Peloponnesian War, that it became an ideological war when, th that Korkira became an ideological event when the two big powers brought the whole Peloponnesian War, the, the, the whole area, down into the Korkirian relationship. Right, my, my list of, uh, of further questions has now grown to four, so I want to cap it there. And I think given where we are in time and the borrowing on our speaker's time, I'd like to ask the four questions to group and then give Marshall and Roger a chance to address them. Okay, and uh, if indeed, if you keep, so I've got uh, Matthew Spark first, and please be as brief as you can under the circumstances. Okay, uh, my question is for both um, Roger and uh, Marshall, and it spirals out of Marshall's, uh, I thought, really compelling point that there's this uncanny um, uh, awareness running through the, the counterinsurgency field manual um, that but that, that never is articulated as such, that, that the real hearts and minds that, that matter are, are um, also back in the United States itself. Um, and it seems to me that um, if we're to understand um, th those hearts and minds today, we have to consider the ways in which um, the kind of uh, combination of, of uh, neoliberalism uh, and sort of 
with, with a Pax Americana vision articulated by the sorts of people like Thomas Barnett that I mentioned, um, rest, it rested on a denial, a denial that, um, that those parts of the world that are considered the gap have actually been connected uh, to us for a long period of time through very uh, uh, expropriatory kinds of connections. And it seem, seems right now, after Iraq and after the financial crisis, that the ability of Americans to, to uh, be um, um, deluded by that kind of denial is increasingly impossible uh, because they see the connections and they see how dispossessing they are. I'm, and as I said, I'm going to gather the questions. Uh, Hugh, unless either speaker has to. I have a question for Marshall. Um, I guess in a way it preempts a question that could be asked of my own paper later. Uh, Marshall, you made uh, an excellent case for the incoherence and uselessness of the counterinsurgency manual. But I'm wondering if you look at the world with the goals of General Petraeus and not the goals of Marshall Silence, are there ways in which or what are the ways in which anthropology can be useful to him? Gather on. Keith. You mean useful for counterinsurgency or what? His goals. Huh? His, His goals. goals. Well, let's gather all the questions because of the situation. Yeah. Keith. Uh, it's an attempt to, to bring the two speakers back together. The, um, so I appreciated especially um, Marshall's brilliant synopsis. But uh, the question I have is about uh, is scale in all of this. So so you, you, you convincingly sort of make the argument that it doesn't really matter what happens. The sort of global ideological struggles end up um, uh, shaping what happens at the local level. And, and uh, we earlier heard the terms of the, putting the genie back in the bottle. It sounds as if uh, our, our, um, the, the, the focus on patronage that we heard in the first talk is a, is, a, is, a, is a sort of attempt to think past the stalemate that we get to when we think that, OK, so the global ideology should shape everything. And there is no alternative path. So it's a very end of Hughes question. Well, what is the, what is the alternative? And I'm especially thinking in, uh, in, in post-former Yugoslavia, one of the things that we've seen with, is a recognition of the, of the, of the partisanization and the polarization of, um, and ethnicization of politics um, and the non-workability of a, a simple majority notion of democracy. And so we've seen these kind of very abstruse and sophisticated efforts to re-engineer democracy. Now, granted, it's a variant of the pottery barn principle of, of Colin Powell. You're trying to fix a problem that the U.S. created in the first place. But I'm just curious if, if, that's, uh, if, if that pottery barn principle, if you see an anthropological take on that as well. Like, is there a shared responsibility on the part of U.S. citizens to try and address something that this U.S. system has tried to, has, has effectively created. Before you answer, we've got one more question, Sean Mitchell. Um, yeah, thank you both for uh, uh, your, your talks. I think uh, maybe part of the reason that it took people uh, a few minutes to formulate questions is that we were uh, offered two uh, virtuoso performances from not only very, uh, not only across a, a disciplinary chasm, as, as John pointed out, but also across a kind of epistemic uh, and, and perspectival chasm as well. Um, uh, and uh, so I guess my question, is, Hugh kind of uh, asked this question to some degree of Marshall, is, is, uh, but I would be interested in seeing the two of you um, uh, to, to think uh, for a second whether you can occupy the other's uh, kind of perspectival position and, and, and see what you have to say. So the question to uh, Marshall then would be, um, uh, is, and, and that perspectival chasm, uh, I would say, is, is precisely that Roger's paper is imagining itself inside uh, the U.S. security apparatus and thinking about how uh, this world that the U.S. is involved with can best be administered. Um, whereas Marshall's perspective is uh, much more a, a outsider's one, a, a critical one. Uh, so my question to Marshall is, uh, is given your vision of anthropology and your, your political vision, is there a, a, an inappropriate, and given the fact of American power today, is there an appropriate insider's role uh, for this kind of social science, which is sort of Hugh's question. Uh, and uh, the question for Roger then is precisely, um, uh, uh, what do you make of Marshall's critique that uh, the counterinsurgency manual and indeed the counterinsurgency project uh, in its own terms is not serious social science? It was an ideal that, uh, and it still is an ideal that, that I think is worth seeing good side of, and I confess to that uh, uh, sense of the possibilities of the century. Um, 
a very important question, first of all, about, about the benevolent interventions. And I, I think, uh, for example, I, th I think Paul Collier has made a persuasive case of a variety of uh, situations where, in terms of what rich nations and powerful nations can do, the, the cost-benefit analysis to help poor people in, in, in some of the worst, uh, uh, poorest countries in the world, sometimes intervening with, 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 with appropriate use of force uh, to stabilize a situation is a could be effective, and, but the, something's missing, uh, and, and there has to be, and, and to me, the most important thing that is needed in thinking coherently about that is the separation of police action from the decision to go in. It has to be judged that, 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 that yes, Britain and the United States in, in, in an appropriate international order could, uh, we, I, th I think, should be anticipating, involved, we should be anticipating that, 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 that a, 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 a a world order that we'd be lucky to have might invo will, will involve interventions by, that, that will be paid for by the, the, the great powers that the, uh, and the United States is first in that line, but that the, the principle should be we need to uh, that a benevolent intervention should be certified as, as, as needed by a jury that is, is, is not materially involved or, the, or that is, is, is not benefiting. The poli police don't decide when the police action is appropriate. Uh, and, and that principle of existence of social order uh, sh is, is, I think, the number one key. That when, not the coalition of the willing who we've bribed, but that we, and we need to, to talk about uh, international institutions, United Nations is an obvious is is obviously first in the line, and uh, or other reg regional organizations where the nations are have some clear political independence of the United States, and where they agree, you know, with that kind of sanction. I think there is a place for uh, for, uh, for American intervention uh, of, of a benevolent sort, and I, I'd like to suggest that. Um, but the number one principle is it's not. I think there's a lot of criticism in this room of, of, of American policy. I think that in the last eight years we've had a horrible uh, uh, failures of, of, of policy, uh, and 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 the number one it, when it was asked uh, the question about uh, American politics. Um, what I would most look forward to in American politics is an understanding of that the following appeal in the 2004 presidential election, uh, it was very effective politics by the, the winning presidential candidate, the, the incumbent, that you know you can trust me, Americans, to use military force whenever it's necessary to protect American security, and I'm not and. Uh, I'm not going to be constrained by any internet, any any foreign voices when I think military forces need to go forward. Clear restraint by the United States that others understand is vital for there to be any hope that the reaction to American use of force is going to be constructive, as opposed to that these we are invaders who who should be resisted to, you know, for the for the benefit of the, of the of the nation. And the basic principle that that American use of military force that is not constrained by principles which the international community can verify uh, in some form is, is, is self-destructive and, and is a large part of, of what, what, what has brought us to a, a terrible international situation on the military front. And I think the Obama administration understands this and, and is uh, in some ways uh, um, working miracles simply by making sure that, 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 that uh, people understand that uh, but I would ask that, that, that the world, that Americans should understand that pol that our political leaders who who don't articulate limits of American power are making it impossible for there to be a, a, any kind of Pax Americana because the, our, our dominance would scare up more op the opposition that would un would would end end this this hope may for I, peace. May I, may I, yep. May I to that? Let me just say that the last. I want to say I, I I really would like you to talk about what what you think uh, anthropological can contribute and, and let me just reiterate I I think the question of what what encourages tribalization or di what 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 fosters tribalization or discourages tribalization uh, tribal identities is a huge question to me. My only take on I look to you for an answer uh, is uh, that I understand that when the state fails to provide individual justice, uh, ju effective protection at, at, for individuals that people have to seek other social structures and, be, and tribal structures and clan structures are going to become more important. Uh, but what makes politicians in a democracy or in any other regime uh, compete on reinforcing 
tribal identity versus reaching out to across boundaries. Both have happened, and I, I would like to learn more about what, what you think, but let me stop there. Yeah, uh, with regard to the first point about America, uh, limiting America power, I certainly agree up to a point that we need a jury to decide about uh, wh wh where and how uh, interventions should take place. But since this is an international human humanitarian question, we need an international humanitarian force to do it, not an American Pax Americana. You can use them, we can, American force can be contributed, but it should be ruled by the world, that is, by the world's organization, and it shouldn't be commanded by Americans, and it shouldn't be organized in the terms of American interests, which is now the problem with American Pax, the Pax Americana. So I, I agree to the procedure, but I don't think it means that we're licensing American intervention. We should license a universal human concern for what's going on in various places. Uh, and that means, yes, strengthening the United Nations, putting American troops under other uh, countries' possible leadership, and all kinds of suspension of American exceptionalism and primacy. Uh, the second thing about the problem with tribal, the, I think the, one of the main problems, uh, um, one of the main processes by which tribalism I is encouraged is, in fact, this discriminatory aid, uh, discriminatory uh, uh, corruption, as it's called, bribery as it might be outright. I mean, bribery is really the latest and only uh, effective counterinsurgency pr practice that Americans discovered. Um, uh, and, but it certainly produces, uh, uh, the, the, it certainly produces factionalism. It produces the, other, the, the discontent of the people who have been discriminated against who are often given the blindness of the way this is, uh, given two factors. One, the blindness of the way this is done. That is to say, no, con no, no consideration of what the traditional relations involved are, whatever is expedient. And secondly, the state that's involved is itself a partisan interest. And that's critical. I mean, that, that has really been the problem. The state uh, in none of these countries that we're talking about is what as you wanted them to be to serve the public interest because they are a sectarian group and they use the power of the state in their own sectarian ends and that includes intervening in the tribal areas uh, the way Maleki is doing now in fact in the tribal areas where he's 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 undermining the tribal councils by creating his own uh, and that kind of thing is going to create more tribal discontent so I think that's you know that's a major a major reason for this. The way this operates is you take differences which have been negotiable for centuries, and you deepen their uh, their stakes, and they make and you make them unconditional uh, oppositions, and that is uh, the that is the real problem, and and the American intervention and. Uh, partisan states, or state, really not states, they are uh, the use of a government uh, for partisan interests are, uh, are, are the reasons. Um, I know we're over time, but I want to, I think Matthew Sparks' question was not fully addressed of all the questions we had, so I'd like to repeat it and amplify it a bit and give each speaker again a chance for, for one final word. I mean, remember, Matthew was telling us about the gap, which we heard about in his paper, and this fact of uh, economic and social connection being the, the, the truth of the matter, that the gap nations are not independent and separated economies, and that we need to take cognizance of that in our modeling of these further interventions, that there already are connections and networks and ongoing relationships. What difference does that make is the question to how we then model from either perspective uh, this, these dilemmas of when to intervene. Does it make a difference to that recognition? There, there, the, the, there, was another, there was another question we didn't answer that I'd like to first address. And that, you, Gus, Gusterson asked, what, what is the role, what can be the role of anthropology? That's, thank you. And I think that uh, the role of anthropology is in, not in the government sphere. It's in the public sphere. The role of anthropology is uh, 
to make known insofar as possible what the, what the conditions that the government is operating in. I have no, I have long experience, long study, long, long you know, longevity is a great career move. You, <laughs> you, you learn a lot of things. <laughs> but um, uh, that, that has convinced me that, uh, that, an, that the cartoon I saw years ago in the Saturday evening post about which show, uh, 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 about the question of working from the inside or working from the outside, uh, how it should be resolved. The cartoon showed two hooded executioners, uh, fully black hooded, uh, each one with a, with a staff uh, with a hatchet on the end of it. And they were in conversation and one turns the other and says, you know, the way I look at it, if I didn't do this, some son of a bitch would get the job. <laughs> and uh, I think that, uh, that working within the administration uh, is uh, putting your, work, your knowledge to the uses which you have no control over and which generally are not the kind of thing that you would like to happen. So I think that we, are, we, should, we should be working in the public sphere we should be, work, you know, it, I too have a whole bunch of un, unpublished op-eds and in fact a whole collection of letters to the New York Times editor, which I intend to publish in my own pamphlet series. <laughs> uh, but it's things website. like that, it's things like that. That's what a website's for. Yeah, more <laughs> that, yeah. Last word, Ron. Uh, about, I think, Oh, this, this strange, the strange, the geography, the globalization. I, of course, that's a fantasy, this gap. But, but I, I, I am prepared to speak uh, in, in some praise of globalization. I think, let me say, uh, Sarah, I, I, I think two really important things have happened uh, in the last s several decades. One is, is, is the end of, 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 a, of a nuclear uh, stalemate between, uh, that, that, that threatened the world with a brink of, uh, of nuclear annihilation any, every day when we got up. Uh, and with the end of the Soviet Union, there was this possibility of a one superpower world, but it was only going to be possible with some stability if um, the United States exercised its military dominance with manifest restraint, and we blew that away in the past administration. That's, that's how I see it. But I also, the, the second is, I think, globalization. I think that um, vast parts of formerly desperately poor countries, mostly in Asia, uh, learn to organize themselves so that the market could penetrate, that they could, that, that people, uh, human capital, people with talents and, and abilities throughout the world could, in, throughout these parts of the world could, could buy and sell through indirect chains. I think the poorest parts of the world are parts of the world where foreigners are afraid to go and where people don't trust that, that, that uh, so I think world trade is a good thing. Uh, one of the things that happened as these countries got much richer is they, uh, but they hadn't quite solved the problem of, of corporate governance, which is uh, which enables people to invest in each other's enterprises without any any uh, uh, any personal connection, and yet feel a sense that the outside investors would, would have their, their their stakes protected. Um, so what they what they did was they wanted to send their money to financial centers in the world part of the world that had. Uh, uh, better corporate governance and great flows. This is because you, you were asked about the financial crisis. Great flows of money, uh, vast wealth, flowed from the poorest, poor countries that, as they, they were becoming richer into the richest countries, they, which water flowing uphill, but it happened because they, they didn't have uh, good financial markets and they trusted American financial markets. Well, the other thing that just happened at the very end of the last administration is we, we blew that trust. I think it's very interesting and almost Shakespearean or something that uh, that, that that simultaneously uh, or you know in 2007 8, 08, uh well the, the trust of, of, of our nuclear uh, of our military dominance was was gradually destroyed over or, or eroded uh, dangerously eroded over over the most over over six years and uh, and then suddenly at the end of this administration uh, uh, the, the financial trust was blown and I think the, I think uh, it is in the, the central point for Americans today is to recognize that we need to rebuild our credible commitment to the world to uh, run financial markets that, that are safe. Uh, uh, although if, if China and India had financial markets that were safe, maybe that water wouldn't have to flow uphill and they could invest more in themselves, which would be a good thing for them, bad for us. 
Uh, but, uh, and, and perhaps we should, and Americans need to learn that we need to uh, exercise such military dominance as we might still be able to afford with uh, more conspicuous restraint um, 